Here's a little Excel trick that's quite neat and not many people know about it. Let's start off sticking some numbers into a simple spreadsheet. OK, now I'm defining a new cell and entering a formula, the sum of those two previous cells, 10 plus 2 equals 12. No surprises here. Now this is what's neat. I go to the Formulas menu, I click on Trace Precedence, and it shows me these little arrows showing which values went into which formula. Now, if you're a normal person, you think, that's neat. That could be really helpful when I'm trying to understand a big complicated spreadsheet like this one. This is one that I found on the web for Amazon sellers to track their earnings. But if you're a computer scientist, you think, can I break this? Let's think, the bottom right cell D6 depends on the top two. But what would happen if I made one of the top cells, C4 for example, depend on D6? Well, there are three things that could happen. One, Excel crashes. Two, this circular reference creates a singularity and the Earth gets sucked into a black hole. Three, Excel figures out there's a problem and won't let you proceed. It's option three. The Earth is safe from singularities, at least for today. OK, so going back to this big complicated Amazon seller spreadsheet, how does Excel detect circular references? And if there aren't any, how does it figure out which order to do all its calculations in? It's not like a nice simple piece of source code where you just step through line by line. There can be dependencies scattered all over the place. That's what this video will be about. The algorithm we'll study is called topological sort. And here's a problem statement. Pause the video, copy out the definition, and then try to find an ordering for these two graphs. Press play when you're ready. For the top graph, there are several total orderings you might have found, like these two. For the bottom graph, you might start out with an ordering that looks promising, but there's always some edge that points the wrong way. In fact, you quickly realise it's impossible for there to be an ordering on account of the cycles. OK, so we've learned that we had better restrict ourselves to graphs that don't have cycles. But the question remains, how can we compute a total ordering? If we think back through all the graph algorithms that we've studied in this course, one that springs to mind is depth first search. The idea of depth first search was that after reaching a vertex, we'll visit all of that vertex's children and other descendants. So how about we just keep track of the time when depth first search visits each vertex? We can be sure that all its descendants will come after it. So sounds like a good candidate for a total order. Let's try it and see what happens. Here's a graph. Here's our depth first search code from the beginning of the course. And let's run it. We need to pick a start vertex to run the algorithm from. Let's say we'll pick A, and then we just visit all the vertices we can reach. And then we realize, hold on, this code doesn't even visit the entire graph. We definitely have to visit all the vertices if we're going to put them in a total order. So let's try again. Here's some code that runs depth first search more than once if needed, choosing a new start vertex each time until it has exhaustively gone through the entire graph. Press pause and have a quick read through the code. And here's an example run through. The outer function, DFS recurse all, triggers two depth first searches, one starting at A, the other starting from H. OK, but how does it do at producing a total order? Let's run through it once again, and this time we'll keep track of the order in which we visit vertices. We start at A, and we put it into our list. Then we visit B, and I'll draw the AB edge, and then visit C, and then F, and then D, and aha, something has gone wrong. When we got to D, and drew in all of these outgoing edges, one of them points in the wrong direction. So this is not a total order. So was our idea of depth first search completely misguided, or is there something we can salvage? Well, 
The thought was good, but we were too hasty in implementing it. We haven't thought hard enough about what Depth First Search actually offers. There's actually a really simple way to tweak this code to produce a total order. I wonder if you can spot it. It's a great idea to pause the video and see if you can work out the answer yourself. But before you pause, let me just show you a way to visualize the program's execution. It's always so much easier to think when you have a good visualization in front of you. I'm going to run through this code again, step by step, but this time I'm going to draw out the execution trace and note down which function we're currently running. Start off by calling DFS recurse all. The first function it calls is visit a, and I'll draw that with the little horizontal bar above the bar for DFS recurse all. When we visit A, we'll visit all of its neighbors starting with B in this case, so I'm going to draw another horizontal bar to show the call to visit B. B has no neighbors, so the call to visit B terminates, and we return to the loop inside visit A. I'll picture this by ending the visit B bar. And then visit A will call visit on its next neighbor, C, and so on. So this visualization shows us the entire program execution, and it shows us when each function call started and ended and where it was called. This is called a flame chart, and if you squint, you can just about make out flickering flames in this diagram. It's actually really easy to get flame charts. Web browsers nowadays have them built in for profiling the JavaScript behind a web page. You just go onto developer tools, tell it to start recording, and then it produces a flame chart for you. Anyway, back to our depth first search. The problem we're trying to solve is this. We want to get a total order on the vertices and this depth first search probably has something useful to tell us. Pause the video, have a think and see if you can spot the total order hiding in this diagram. Here is the key insight, the proper way of understanding what depth first search gives us. Look at the time when visit A returns. We won't return from visit A until we've finished visiting all of A's descendants, which means all of A's descendants are on the left of this point where we return from visit A. In other words, we shouldn't keep track of when each call to the visit function starts, we should keep track of when it returns. Let's walk through the code once more. First, we'll declare a list total order initially empty. We call visit A, which calls visit B. B has no neighbors, so visit B just returns without calling anything else but before it returns, it appends B to our total order list, and so on. Now, at D, I'm going to draw on all of D's outgoing edges. None of the other vertices we've recorded so far have had any outgoing edges, so I haven't needed to draw them in, but D does have edges. It points to B and E and G and all of these edges point backwards to vertices that are already in the total order. And so on. And eventually we return from DFS recurse all. So this is the algorithm for finding a total order and it's called topological sort. It actually returns a reversed total order, but if you wanted the vertices the other way around, you just replace the append on line 17 with a prepend. 
This algorithm is basically just depth first search, so its running time is exactly the same. It's big O of V plus E. And here's the statement of correctness. If we run this algorithm on a directed acyclic graph, or DAG, then it returns a proper, correct reverse total order. We saw earlier that there's no point running this algorithm on a graph with cycles, because if there are cycles, then it's impossible to put all the vertices into a total order. This theorem says that for every graph that doesn't have cycles, then a total order exists, and furthermore, that this algorithm finds it. I'm not going to go through the details of the proof in this video. I'm just going to talk through the outline, and I'll leave you to read all the details in the accompanying lecture notes and remind you that the proof is examinable material. This proof is yet another breakpoint style proof, but this time it's slightly simpler because there's no proof by induction needed. Let's consider an arbitrary edge in the graph, let's say V1 to V2. We want to argue that V1 and V2 will end up the right way around in our total order, V2 to the left of V1, so that all edges in our total order point leftwards. Let's set a breakpoint at line 13 at the instant where we've just started the call to visit V1. What the proof involves is arguing that either V2 must already have been appended to the total order, or it will be appended in the course of the current call to visit of V1. Either way, V1 will be appended after V2. And the argument that we need here is a lovely little thing. It involves reasoning about what must have happened earlier during the execution. And to make that reasoning clear, we'll manifest the execution history into the data structure with these three comment lines here. The idea is that as we run through the code, we'll mark all the vertices we touch with a certain color so that at the breakpoint, we can survey all the colors of the vertices we're interested in and make a deduction about which lines of code were run when. This coloring isn't part of the algorithm itself. It's, it's not used in any of the steps. It's just there as an aid for the maths proof to let us see the execution history manifested itself as annotations to the data structure. Okay, so this brings us to the end of our survey of graph algorithms. We've covered quite a few algorithms. I don't want you to get the impression, though, that the study of algorithms is just a recipe book, algorithm after algorithm. What we've really seen here, when we were studying topological sort, is that it's just another take on depth first search. And the same for Prim's algorithm. Prim's algorithm is just another take on Dijkstra's algorithm for shortest paths. And maximum size matching is just an application of the ford fulkerson algorithm for finding max flows. In fact, Kruskal's algorithm turns out to be deeply linked to ford fulkerson too. I'll say more about the link between those two at the end of the course. And then on top of this, there are some general strategies we've seen. We've seen the translation strategy, which is behind Johnson's algorithm and also the maximum size matching problem. What I want you to take away from all this is that algorithms are not finished pieces of code. Algorithms are ideas that you can remix and repurpose. You're meant to be like a chef. You're meant to learn flavors and techniques that you can use in novel situations. You're not just a cook who learns recipes by rote. The next section of the course will be all about one major new technique to add to the mix called amortization. It's behind some lovely and very advanced algorithms and data structures.